Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study at Manchester Church of God. Welcome to everybody here and everybody online. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord tonight so that we can study His Word and uh, hopefully draw um, some strength from His Word and be encouraged. And so this is what, you know, I would like for us to get. And I told Miss Karen on the way over here, I said, Karen, did you read uh, chapter 9 this week? She said, well, I started it and it seemed a little bit hard. I said, well, it is a little hard. <laughs> But we will get through it because it has a lot, a lot more into it once we get in, into it than up front just being a, a little bit different. But Romans has a lot of stuff in it. It has a lot of stuff to cover, a lot of good stuff, though. But I think it has a lot of history, a lot of things about how the, the church developed, how things started, which helps us to understand how we got to where we are today and really what God's purpose is things. So before we get started, let's take prayer requests and um, praise reports. So. I know, Wilma, you mentioned a couple of people that needed prayer, so. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, Sharon. Yes. Oh my! So yes. So pray for Karen. Oh, that's tough. So just pray for her. The other two are doing better. Okay. Doing better. Okay. Marsha has a friend that had a heart attack, so let's keep them in your mind, in our prayers and our mind and thoughts. Yes, praise reports. That's wonderful. <laughs> the test <laughs> God is answering prayer, yes. Mm. The infection was in the bone, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's pray for him. Because he's had a rough go. He really needs some healing, yes. for Miss Mary's friend with bladder cancer. Yes. Let's pray for the youth who are at camp, that they'll just be transformed, that God will just show up in a way that they will just be renewed, and they have a blessed time. You're right. You're right. Did they? Uh, and them worship, and that's great. Uh, just let God move and just transform their lives. Because these kids have to battle things that you and I never even dreamed of. And so it's just so tough. So, oh, man. Anybody else before we go to the Lord in prayer? All right, let's just pray. Lord, we just come into your presence with thanksgiving. We come into your courts with praise. Lord, I'm thankful unto you, and I bless your name. Lord, I give you honor. I give you praise, Lord. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, Lord, you're worthy to be praised. And, Lord, we honor you tonight. And we just lift your name on high. Lord, we come before you, lifting up these who need a healing touch, Lord. You said you're our healer. You said you sent your word and healed our disease. And, Lord, I pray for every person that needs a healing touch. You see each one. You can go individually where they are, Lord. And I ask that you'll go and minister to them in a personal level, Lord, that they will experience you in a deeper way, Lord Jesus. 
Lord, I pray for the youth at youth camp. Oh, Holy Spirit, I ask that you will move and rain down upon them like never before, Lord, that they'll be forever changed because they've been in the presence of God. I pray, Lord, for, that you would just minister to each person here. I ask that you'll meet all of our needs, be it physical, spiritual, financial. Lord, I ask you for what that you will see each of us and that you will draw each of us closer to you like never before, Lord. I ask that you will just help us to understand what your word has to say tonight. As you guard my heart and my tongue and my mind as I teach these things, let me say only those things you would have me to say. And Lord, we just want to thank you. We just want to thank you and praise you for what you've done. We thank you for the answer to the prayers that you're answering, Lord. And I ask that you will just go with us in thy name we pray. Amen. Here we go back to the book of Romans. And um, I want to say thank you, John, for filling in for me. And I was, I was very appreciative of that. That gave me a little bit of time off. And so um, I enjoyed my time off, but I also miss being here. So good, good. <laughs> I thought he might teach that. <laughs> I thought he would teach, I would, would teach Romans 9 for me. Now, he told me probably he would not go into Romans. <laughs> he said he'd probably do something else. I should have just called him a chicken, shouldn't I? <laughs> But no, uh, it's, it's really not as difficult as we think it is. It's just kind of a lot of wordy. But Paul seems to be a wordy person. So, <laughs> But at the same time, there's such rich nuggets in his writings. Uh, it's worth spending, spending the time to go through. And sometimes I think, well, this just seems real redundant. And it, yes, it is. But we'll understand that a little bit further on down here. But again, our key verse has been Romans 1.17. It says, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from the first to the last, just as it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. And boy, is that not the true thing he's trying to tell us. The righteous are going to live by faith, not by works or anything else. And he reiterates it over and over. And again, sometimes I think we forget this was embedded in these people. The law, this is what they had lived by. It's what they had grown up on. And you know as well as I do, there are things that we have been grown up with that we can't get out of our mind, and we can't change. It's just habits that we have. You know, we cook certain things, we eat certain things, and, and because that's the way we grew up. So you have to realize these people grew up with this. So even though a lot of them became born again, they still had to deal with this old thing of the law that kept creeping them up. And I can see that because it was their culture. It was where they were. And he was part of that culture. He was there, and he grew up in that, and he was a Roman citizen there. And in verse chapter 8, you know, we ended in that one that the uh, believers secure in Jesus and that God's election would stand. And did God make a mistake? And this is one of the things he said. But then this is the thing. Back in chapter 8, he talk, we talked about being more than conquerors. And we talked about knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that was such rich stuff. And then he comes to chapter 9. And it's almost, I felt like he was almost depressed in chapter 9. <laughs> but I'm sure it's not depressed on here. But again, like I said, you've got to remember he was a Roman citizen. But this is the other thing. Historians say he probably was in, under house arrest when he wrote this. So, so let's keep that in back of his mind, in our mind, as we read this. Again, like I said, he was a, Paul was a, Duke, a Jew, so his nature had a kindred spirit with him. He loved those people. He had grown up with them. He knew them. He knew they were. He had lived with them. He would lived under the law with them until he was born again. And so he, was, and so he was really concerned. And so let's start with verse uh, nine, uh, Romans chapter nine, verse one through five. And so he moves like this from the joy from Romans eight to this sorrow and burden in chapter nine. So he says, verses one through five, says, "I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and in, an unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people." Those of my own race, the people of Israel. There's this adoption to sonship. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. There's are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever praised. Amen. So think about what he's saying here. He says, I have anguish in my heart over these people. Miss Karen and I were talking to the way over here. She said, Now, you know, I see America, and we're in trouble, and I, I, you know, I pray for people, but I don't know that I have the anguish that Paul has, that he had here over the Jewish people. 
I don't think we as Christians have that anguish over our country on there. Um, and I'm not sure that it's, when I say this, that was call, Paul's calling to be there. We are to call to be witnesses. And you will know when God places a burden on you to pray for someone and, and when you have been heavy burden and almost angu in anguish in prayer when you've been praying for someone. And so he was saying this is what's happened to him. He said, this is my own race. And he says, my heart is so heavy for them. And you think about this. He's been, taught, he's been teaching these people all through Romans 1 through 8. We've already, and he's been teaching them over and over and over. And still yet he's seeing his people there, the people around the Jewish, the people there, still trying to live under the law. And I'm sure it had to be anguish in his heart because he had preached and he had taught them, and he had spoken to them, but yet at the same time, he loved those people because he had lived there with them. And so, again, for us, in our country, like I said, we worry about our country. We pray for our country. But I'm not sure we feel the anguish that he feels at, uh, for our country. And I'm not sure, and like I said, maybe I'm wrong, so I just correct me, but I don't know that God would want us to carry a burden that deep because that maybe is not our calling. Now, I, have, I know most of us probably have been burden for uh, someone where we couldn't we, we fasted we prayed we sought god but for the country in general i don't know that i've ever been called to do that now i could be wrong i know god calls for us to pray but not to that point have i ever been to and i'm sure probably most of you never have either probably for family members we have been for different situations in the church maybe but never for that and i thought well i wonder what it would be like if we were that in that great anguish over our country if, if everyone who called themselves a Christian, what kind of dramatic change would we see? We would be different. If we were so overwhelmed that we were just, our heart was just overwhelmed in, in, in anguish and pleading for God and pleading with God for our country, I think we would be different. And, um, you know, and we may get to that point in America to where we as Christians humble ourselves that much and get to this point. It could get that bad for us on there because usually what? When the hard times come, persecution comes, we usually fall to our knees and even pray even more. And then verse 4 and 5, he talks about Israel being adopted by God as his own people. The purpose of all the blessings that was that Jesus Christ came through Israel into this world. If you think about that, you go back over here in this first part, he says, he says part of this, he said, the people of Israel, there's adoption, sonship. They were given this divine glory and these covenants and he thinks, he says, theirs are the patriarchs from where from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah. I think sometimes we forget that, that that's where the Messiah came down, the ancestry of that came down through the Romans. And we forget that. And how would we feel? And we, I try to think about this. Here, the Messiah came down through the ancestry, but yet at the same time, they still reject him as being the Lord. Sometimes that's just hard for me to grasp, to think that that's where he came from. He was came down through that lineage there, but at the same time, these are the people who reject him. Now, I know we think, Lord, if, if, if the baby Jesus was born in my family, I might, you know, we'd just be holier than everything, but I wonder, would we? Or would we soon forget like they did some? Yeah, I think later on it talks about it, but yes, that there is a veil over their eyes, you know, on there, and sometimes it's hard for me to understand about the veil being over their eyes because how did the veil get there? Did they choose the, for the veil to be there, or was the veil put there for protection from God? To for the, because we don't understand all the mysteries of the word. There is no. I wish I could understand the mysteries. I wish I could understand every mystery that was written in this chapter here, but I don't understand that. And I think sometimes he covers the veil on our eyes for things to happen and come to pass and for things that we might want to know when we get to heaven, but we probably won't ask when we get there because we'll be worshiping. That's what I think about that on there. In verse 5 again, he talks about them being adopted by God his own people. But in spite of all the blessings, Israel failed. Now think about that. Again, you and I think, well, if Jesus had been born in our family, we wouldn't fail. We would do what he said. They were his family, but they rejected him. Why is it that our family is the hardest ones to reach? Well, Zach, the prophet, honors his own country. 
And we wouldn't think that because he was the Christ, he was the Messiah. But again, remember, he, they knew him as a person. They wanted him to rule and reign. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Exactly. They were expecting something else. Exactly. Exactly. And so when he didn't raise himself up to be the king, not of this world, yes. Mm -hmm. But in spite of all the blessings Israel felt, when the Messiah appeared, Israel rejected him and crucified him. Now, that's hard to get a grasp of. This is a person who came down from the lineage of there. But like you said, because he didn't raise up the, ki the kingdom like they had wanted him to, like the expectation was. And so they were part of the ones who cru crucified him. And listen, Paul knew this better than anybody because Paul was there. He knew that. But again, does, God's, does Israel's failure mean that God's work failed? No. Mm -mm. God is faithful no matter what. What people may do with his word individually, as a nation, as a country, as a pastor, church leaders, God's word never fails. He never fails. Um, and then he goes into verse 6 through 10, and I thought this was real interesting when he talks about this on here. Um, verse 6 through 10 says, It is not as though God's word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offsprings will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by the father Isaac, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in the election might stand. Now, let's talk a little bit about this because I thought, what is he talking about there? And what he's talking about when here, there is a difference between a natural seed and a spiritual seed. Now, let's go back and think about Abraham. What did God say? He told him and Sarah, well, you're going to have a son. And they waited and waited and waited. And the, like the pastor's sermon on Sunday, they decided to help God out. Now, back in the Jewish culture, what son received the blessing? The firstborn. Who was the firstborn? Ishmael. Ishmael didn't receive the blessing because that was not who God said should be the firstborn. Born. That was God said Isaac would be the firstborn. Abraham and Sarah decided Ishmael would be the firstborn. From there. And so this is one of the things that I thought was interesting here. It is not the natural descent. Like I said, it's what God had designed. God had planned that it would be Isaac because Isaac was the promise and he would come from those, the generation that. It wouldn't be Ishmael. And so I wonder, so think about this. And, and when God set these things in order and then all of a sudden Abraham and Sarah decided to do something else to bring another child. So what happened then? There's Ishmael and then you have Isaac which received the blessing. But how many times has God told us something? And we've tried to fix it ourselves. And we've tried to do it. And rather than waiting on God and waiting on his promises, and we've messed up. I think probably all of us at one time in our life has experienced something like that. Or we've done something we shouldn't have done because we thought we could help God out. And so when you look at this, and I thought, well, why is that in Romans? Why is that important today? But this is why we have to understand there are design thing, things that God has set in place and in order, and we need to listen and not get ahead and not try to fix things ourselves. And or like me, sometimes I just go about my own way and, and do things. Not really, not that I'm being disobedient, but I just really didn't pray to seek what God really wanted about the situation. I made my own decision without consulting God. And I'm sure we've all done that. And this is what Abraham and this is what um, Sarah did. This is the thing that they did. And remember on Pastor Sunday, on uh, Sermon on Sunday, how he talked about how those decisions change things? They've been in war for, ever since. 
today. They're still fighting today. And I would think if an angel comes stood before me and spoke to me, I might believe it. However, you're 90 and 100. That's one thing. <laughs> I would hope it would not true at 90 and 100. <laughs> but this is, how many times has the Holy Spirit spoken something to us, a promise? And yet, we still go about like it's not going to come true, like it's not, 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 not God's going to handle it. And the reason we do it is just like Sarah Ham, uh, Sarah, Sarah Ham, Abraham and Sarah is we want to help God out. Or we get tired of waiting. Or we haven't seen the answer. So therefore, we think we can do something to make the answer come quickly. I know we've all been guilty of that. And sometimes we've really regretted it, haven't we? Other times it might not have been as bad. But there have been times we've had... No. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Salvation came for the Jews, and Ishmael was not. No. And that's why he talks about here the firstborn order on here. And when I read that, I thought, boy, why does that even pertain to us today? Because that's just really hard. But when I got to reading and studying and then thinking about this, Abraham and Sarah is no different than you and I are. We have to listen to God, we have to hear what he's saying, we have to seek God and listen to what he's saying for our life. I'm sure we've all made decisions we wish we'd have never made because we just stepped out and did what we wanted to do rather than hearing from God. And I know all of us have been there. And aren't we glad that God forgives us and says, okay, come back, we'll try this again. And, uh, and I try to tell myself, listen a little more. And you're all a little closer to the Lord. Listen to what God's saying. You know, and as I'm getting older and studying more and reading more, I'm understanding that God says he's in control. And when he says, I'm in control, we need to let him be in control. But we, as a human nature, we, oh, yeah, God's in control. And then we just jump right out running before him. And we kind of come back and say, okay, God, you're in control of this situation. You're handling this situation. You can resolve this situation. Does that mean I sit still and do nothing? No. I seek the Lord. I listen for his voice. I wait for him to give me opportunity to work on the situation. If he says, do this or do that in the situation... But I need to make sure that I am not running ahead of what he says because we want to get everything done on our time and our way, and it's not always the way it is. And maybe sometimes I think there are things that maybe God, my, God's blessings that maybe he had for us, but because we ran ahead and did something else and made a decision somewhere, we lost that blessing. But, you know, God is so good, he'll bless us again. He's not selfish with his blessings. He cares about us. And even though we mess up and even though we make decisions, sometimes that maybe is not exactly what his divine plan was for us, he again can bless us. And I'm so thankful for that. Uh, the difference between the natural seed of Abraham and the spiritual children of Abraham, like I said, since Ishmael should have been chosen. Now, I want to think about what would have happened had Ishmael been chosen. I mean, we look at the wars that goes on in the countries that the way they are there. The descendants of Israel. But then we go back and look at Isaac and the descendants of him on here and how we can uh, learn from all of that. And again, like you said, they've been at war ever since the beginning of this happened. So let's think about this. If this had not happened, would there be war over there? Somebody else would have picked the fight. And, and we don't know that it would be or would not, would not be. But again, it's for us, for our learning, to understand that don't get ahead of God. Let's listen to what he says on here. Let's talk about Jacob and Esau. Now, that's an interesting story as well, isn't it? Esau and Jacob had the same father and the same mother, and Esau, being the firstborn, should have been chosen. God did not make his election on the physical. Therefore, if the nation of Israel... Abraham's physical descendants has rejected God's word. This does not nullify God's purpose at all. So let's go ahead and talk about Esau and Jacob. So what happened? Who got the blessing? Because uh, yes, and Jacob got it. But who was the firstborn there? Esau. 
On there. Jacob didn't care. Mm -mm, no, on there. Again, like I said, but because these things, these blessings did not come down to Israel, this type of thing, um, God's word didn't change. His purpose and his will, just like I said for us, sometimes when we get out of God's will or we, don't, we miss God's blessing, God's will does not change. He will still carry us along. He will still bless us as we move into different areas on there. Now, I wonder when I get to heaven, will there be, and I just wonder this, okay, is there going to be a movie that says this was my divine purpose for you? Now, this is just my thoughts. Or is this the path, or, is, or here's the movie that says this is the path you chose. It probably won't even matter to us when we get there. But I just, I just sometimes think, okay, was this my, is the journey I've on, is this been your divine purpose? Does your ever wonder like that, or is it just me? No, I'm only one wonders about that. What would it have been like? Yeah. Um, and the, um, has anybody ever read the book called The Traveler's Journey? It is a real interesting book. And um, in this book, Pilgrim's Progress, <laughs> in this Traveler's Journey, I wish I could tell you who the author is. You would know if I told you. Um, but um, what happened was, uh, it starts off, he has a car wreck. And God takes him to heaven. And he walks through all of these places. And he kept walking through this particular warehouse. And there's things upon a shelf and things upon a shelf. And then it was pictures. And so he pulled the pictures down and looked, and it was pictures of babies, pictures of children. And um, the, the, so the gist of the thing is he comes back um, from this car wreck. He, he didn't actually go to heaven. But he and his wife had decided not to have any more children. But in the course of this journey, he felt like that was God telling him, these would have been your children. And it was just real interesting in, the, in this story about how that he walked in there. And I thought, and that made me think of that when we see, you know. And so he walked in this, and he kept going to this one place and kept seeing those pictures. And then, I don't know, like I said, he was, he was in a coma or supposedly or something other. And when he woke up and he said, those would have been my children had we decided to have children. And so that's what made me wonder, would we see God's divine will? Of course, I don't think that's really what heaven's like. It ain't a warehouse, I don't think. But it just made me think there are probably choices we've made, things that, that, that may not have been totally exactly what God wanted for us. But yet at the same time, we walk through those things because we grew spiritually. God brought us through those things. Maybe where they were bad or maybe they were good things. But then he maybe puts us in different situations for different reasons. You know, I don't, I don't understand all of that. But I thought that was real interesting on, on that book. And it's been several years ago since I read the thing. But because I kept saying, what are the pictures? What are the pictures? What are the pictures? I couldn't wait to get to the end what the pictures were. And he said, those would have been children that you would have had on there. And so, and this is the thing with us. I, we can never understand totally what God's sovereign will is for us, I don't think. Um, but we try to make the best decisions that we can in what we have according to his word. The biggest thing is, is for us just to continue seeking his word, seeking the guidance from the Holy Spirit to live as close as we can. Do I think God's will for all, each of us is to live a perfect life with no kind of trouble? No, because he says in this world we're going to have trials and tribulations. So therefore, and there would be no need to go to heaven if everything was perfect here. So we're going to have to go through the, some of those things on them. Any thoughts on that before we go on to the next part? Mm-hmm. Or not, exactly. Till later, exactly, exactly. I, I, I think you can look back. 
Mm-hmm. You didn't know. It's, I think that's the way all of us, and, I, and I probably it's good that we don't know. Let us walk through and learn what we need to walk, walk through and learn, and let us grow a little deeper. Hindsight is twenty twenty on that. And I'm like, I'm like, uh, Wilma, there are things in my life, I look back now, and I know those were di God's divine appointments and God's divine purposes. At the time, I didn't know that. And then you, you go back and, and we look now and say, okay. So we never know when there might be something divine, God is out there that God prompts us to do. We just need to listen and do it on that. Um, in verse 11 through 13, he talks about it. it's not human merit again. Yet before the twins were born, we're talking about Jacob and Esau are, are had done anything good or bad in the order that God's purpose in the election might stand, not by works, by him who calls, she was told. The older will serve the younger, just as it's written, Jacob I've loved and Esau I've hated. Now, we've heard that scripture and we've seen that scripture. Does that literally think he, he hated Esau? No. He hated his sacrifice. I think. So, basically, I think it's a figure of speech, basically, to contrast the two. I love this one more than I do this one. And again, why? Because the, the sacrifice, the things, they knew what they were doing. He, Esau knew what he was doing. They knew the things they were doing on there. Because God does not hate anybody. He does not on there. And he says here, because, oh, let me remember that here. The emphasis is on how um, God's loved Esau enough to bless him as well. Even though he says, I hated Esau, Jacob I've loved, and Esau I've hated. Does that mean he hated him? No. He blessed him as well. And we'll see. You can, if you go back and read the scriptures, you can see that. He blessed him. But God chose uh, Jacob before the babies were born. The two boys had done neither good or evil. That's hard for us to understand, isn't it? So God's choice was not based on the character or conduct. In verse 13, it says, Just as it is written, Jacob I've loved, but I, Esau I've hated. Again, this is a reference. goes all the way back to Malachi. And he talks about here, and he says, I've turned this hill country into wasteland and left the inheritance in the desert. And he talks about this. But then this also refers to the nations of Israel and Edom as well. Edom, which was now what, southern, southwestern Jordan? Is that a Christian nation? No. Again, you see the contrast again. Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob, the descendants what came, and we're still seeing it today, the results of it today. But again, like I said, because God said he hates, God does not hate sinners. Let's make it sure, clear. John 3, 16 is a plain scripture that says God so loved the world. He loves everyone. But again, this refers to the descendants that come down, what happens, because what happened to each of these countries, Israel at points have rejected God. And so has the Jordanian area. Those people, they have their own religions. They are just totally against God. Um, he married, uh, married foreign women. Mm -hmm. it, what he saw what Esau was going to do. You're right. You're right. Yes, he did. He did bless Ishmael. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. But the thing I think we have to understand that God is faithful even when we are unfaithful. And isn't that true? He still blesses us even when we haven't done everything right. He still keeps us on there. Um, then in uh, verse 14 through 18, it talks about God's righteousness. And this is some interesting scripture. It says, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Let's go back to what he's talking about. He's talking about here, blessing one, not blessing the other. Is he unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have a com compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but God, on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, that by my, that by my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens those heart he wants to harden. And let's think about this. It seems kind of unjust, but let's go back and talk about what he's talking about here. Let's think about Pharaoh. Okay. Had there not been a Pharaoh, 
There might not have been a deliverance. So let's think about the, the curses came. All the plagues came. Pharaoh saw the plagues. At any time, I, in, 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 at any time during the course of this, I think he could have said, okay, God, I know you're God. But instead, he keep, kept hardening his heart and just ignoring that God was God. I'm here. But God could extend his mercy toward Pharaoh. Now, you think about this. God had warned him over and over and over and over, and he just became harder and harder. Have you ever known anybody that God has called and maybe they've, used, they've been in God's will and then they got out of God's will and they seem to just go 100 degrees the other direction than what God has? They just seem to harden their heart and turn totally against God. I mean, you would, I've known some people, a couple of people that just went totally against God. And how did they get over here from being here? What happened on there? But again, just like Pharaoh, those people that have known God did those things. But Pharaoh saw those things every day. And, and you would think if we saw those plagues and things change on the plagues, and I think we would have known there was a God. Wouldn't you think that we would have known there was a higher, that God was in control of the situation? Why, did, why would I not turn to him? Pharaoh thought he was God. Let's go back to Garden in Garden of Eden. Why did Adam and Eve take the fruit? What did Satan say to him? You will be like God. That's been the struggle all along, hasn't it? On here. Trying to be like God in, in, in here. Because he knew, let's face it, he had taken all these, uh, all these people captive, the Israelites captive. And let's face it, he was the king. They were underneath him. He was power. He was powerful. They had free labor. Yeah, he told us he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Now, that's one part I really just not even understand. Does anybody have any comments on that part of it? God wanted to show the miracles? Mm-hmm. Well, also, probably, let's think about this. Had there been one plague, and that's all there was, you think the children of Israel might would have left or not left? <laughs> that's a plague. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never parted life. Yeah. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Why? They missed onions and cucumbers, didn't they? Garlic and cucumbers. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you get from seeing those plagues? Again, I think it probably took that many plagues for them to be ready to go. I'm not sure how much to do with Pharaoh. <laughs> The death of the firstborn, to let him go. He chased after him. He did not let him go. But see, here, I hear we're seeing two contrasting things. Does God hate Pharaoh? Did God hate Pharaoh? Mm -mm. It, it is just hard for us to understand that God had compassion on Pharaoh as well. He gave him every opportunity. Yes, yes. Continue to disobey. I think you, I think you can uh, lose God's blessings, yes. Mm -hmm. Again, like these two things that we've looked at here, Esau and Pharaoh, it still shows us that God is a God of mercy and God has grace for us. Um, in verse 15, it talks about mercy. Uh, Moses said, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy on. You've got to remember here, Israel still, after... They just, after seeing all these plagues and things, they still went back to idol worship. But God was still merciful. But how many times maybe have we slipped back off into idol worship? We may not have an idol. taking the strange wives, not pleasing God. He knew those things. Solomon, you're right. 
Exactly. It is so easy for the world to slip in. And let me just say this, and of course I know I'm meddling right here. But when things of this world occupy all of my time and I have no time for God, I have an idol. When I am so distraught and worried and fear or angry at somebody or mad at somebody, and that's what occupies my mind, I have an idol. When I want to do something for me, 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 me all the time, I have an idol. So we can't get too being out of shape over here. We see in Pharaoh and the children of Israel because there's some of us in every one of these people. There's some of me in every one of these people because we have to guard against these things. And we're, and that's the truth. <laughs> Have it your way. <laughs> you need this. Yes. Again, we don't always understand God's sovereign over all this stuff. It's very hard for me to get, grasp all of this. But this is the thing I know about us. He works his own will and his own purpose. But he gives us the opportunity to draw close to him and know what his will and purpose is if we will draw close to him and hear his voice on there. Now, we live in a world. We can't get out of this world. We, we live in this human body. We live with this mind, will, and emotions. All of us do. And again, we will struggle with it. I don't think we'll ever have it 100% under control until I have a glorified body. But at the same time, it is up to us to make the decision that we do not want to be like Pharaoh on there. Um, and then verse 19 through 21, this is what I think is really a very eye-opening verse for all of us. We just think about this. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed? Um, so what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for some special purposes and some for common use? Again, think about this. Who are we? We are clay in the potter's hand. And who are we to tell that clay what to do with us? <clears throat> God has a design for each of us. And God is wiser than we are. And sometimes we can be foolish about questioning his will. Do I think we're allowed to ask God, I don't understand this? Yes. But when we go through things, who are we as the clay who has the right to say to the potter, you don't know what you're doing. I'm not going to submit to your will. Who are we? You know, I think about Israel. I think about the war, Iraq. I think about the governments that's all anti-God. I think about the religions that are anti-God. All it would take is one stroke, and it would be over with. Now, let's think about that's the potter. That's the potter, and we're the clay. And like I said, God is wiser than we are, and sometimes... You know, we want to question his will. I mean, have you known anybody to get angry with God when something happened in their life and they just couldn't get over the anger and the bitterness toward God? I understand where his will, this is a reference, the clay does not have life. And it's in, in a potter's hand. Unfortunately, we as humans, we have feelings and intellect and willpower and we can resist him if we choose. Have anybody ever done any pottery? I tried it one time, and I'm not real good at that stuff. You know, it just seemed to get out of control for me. So that would be how I feel my life. I'd be on the spinning thing, and I'd be out of control, but God's got it in control. <laughs> He's making me into a perfect vessel <laughs> if I will allow him. But if I'm not pliable, and I don't, don't allow him to change me, 
How does God change us? He begins to speak to us. Little by little, little by little. And this is one of the things I thought it said up in here. And it says, um, does the potter have the right to make uh, the same lump of clay, some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Now, let's think about this. Because we have a tendency in church to think the leaders, the praise team, the pastor, that's a beautiful pot. And I'm nothing. I'm just a little piece of common clay, so to speak. But no. He makes each of us how we need to be. Some people are going to be a pastor. Not every one of us in here can pastor this church. Can you imagine having 20 pastors? So we have to adapt to where we are and what he wants us to be. What is it that he wants to be? Do I say to just a, a beautiful vase, oh, you're much more better than my dishes in the cabinet that I use every day? No. We have to have all of it. So we can't begin to judge one another because what the potter made them, but we have a tendency to some, sometimes to think, well, the pastor's more holy than I am, the priest is more holier than I am, on all of that. We have the same Holy Spirit living inside of us that the pastor does. Now, I'm not saying that pastor's office is not to be honored and that worship leaders should be godly. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying, we all have the same Holy Spirit in us. And God wants to use us in wherever we are. Again, we all have to be somewhere at work, Walmart, different places. There are things that God wants to use us. So we just have to let him use us in the way that we want to be used in. Again, like I said, we as individuals, though, we have feelings, intellect, and sometimes we'll say, I don't want to be used like that. I'm not willing. So we can shut down the Holy Spirit. And he'll say, well, I'll move to the next vessel who wants to be used. No. Get you used more frequently? You're right. I have some vases I don't ever use. I have my dishes I use every day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I just don't want to do that. <laughs> don't have a good excuse. I just don't want to do it. But God gives each of us different abilities, and he has a plan for each of our lives. However, that does not excuse me and you because maybe we're on a different level from deep, deepening in our walk with Christ. It is what God's design is for each of us, is to deepen our walk with Christ and to walk in the way that he would have us to go. Okay, good. i got a little bit more time. All right. Any thoughts on that? Had you ever thought about being the potter and the clay like that? And I never had really thought about it being that some, some was made for pottery for special purposes and some for common use. But you think about it, They had certain things that back in those days that they used it at different things. And let's face it, if we have a wedding or something, we bring out the fine china, we bring out this and that. I don't use the fine china every week. Most of the time, you usually get the paper plate, you know. You get china. <laughs> <Not> very... <laughs> paper plates, but, th but think about it. We're in that plastic somewhere, too. But... Yeah. <laughs> He doesn't like plastic. <laughs> How do we get from clay to that? <laughs> but anyway, verse 22 through 24, but God has his purposes. The summary of these scriptures let us know that we must never think that God enjoyed watching a tyrant like Pharaoh. Now think about that. You think God enjoyed that? No. I think God's heart's desire for Pharaoh was the like it is for me and you today, that he would turn. I think that because he loved him. Because God loves everyone, right? But he's long-suffering, and he gave Pharaoh opportunities to be saved. And he says, um, verse 23 says, states that God prepares man for glory, but sinners prepare for themselves judgment. God prepares for man glory. That's what God would have for all of us. But because we choose sin over God, then there's judgment for our consequences for our sins on that. Um, Romans 9, 22 through 24 says, What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepare for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us, whom he called, not only when the Jews, 
but he also called from Gentiles. Now, let's know what he's saying here because this looks a little complicated. But what he's saying, there were some things that were prepared, prepared for destruction to make his glory of his riches known. What was God's design? Jews and Gentiles were born again, that they would become Christians, not just Jews. It was Jews and Gentiles. That was what he wanted both here. And so when he came and died on the cross for us, he died both for the Jews and Gentiles. But the destruction that Pharaoh and him caused, if you think about that, that destruction was used so that the Israelites could go free so that they, he could advance for his glory. And that's hard for us to understand because we weren't there. How can you use something like that for your glory? But how many times have we seen someone maybe have a death in a family or something or another and God used it for his glory? Not that he individually took that person out for that reason. I'm not saying that because I don't know what the reason is. But how many times have we seen good things come out of bad things? We all have. So, therefore, again, God's ultimate plan when he sent Jesus to earth was that both Jews and Gentiles would be born again. That was God's ultimate plan. That's why he came to earth, so that all lost people may be saved. And we were all lost. We are all sinners, be it Jews or Gentiles. Again, you go back to here again, where the Israelites thought law saved them. Again, no, God died on the cross for them. Jesus died on the cross for them because the law could not save them. And so these horrible things that they went through, God used his purposes to bring about his will on there. And again, my mind don't understand that, why we have to do that. But I know us as human natures, most of the time when we get closer to God is when we're forced to get close to God. We go through a tough trial or we go through something or else really dark or else just something with our family or whatever. What was the first thing we start to do? We run to God, right? Because if everything was just good and or ordinary and everyday life and just going on happily, some of us would probably never pray. So therefore, he uses some of these things for his glory on there. Um, Paul quoted in Hosea stating that, the, that God would turn from the Jews and call the Gentiles. Now, that was unheard of, you think about, back, back in those days. Because the Jews were it. The, the Gentiles, they called them what? Dogs? There were nobody as far as they were concerned. And why would God, of all people, have something to do with the Gentiles? And so God's purpose, again, was that the Jews and the Gentiles, all mankind, would be born again. That was God's ultimate purpose for sending his son here to earth. That was it on here. And so when we look back at history, look about what he's talking about, them, um, even though the Jews and the Israelites were God's chosen people, his desire from sending God to God sending his son was for both Jews and Gentiles. Now, think about this. Again, Israel being God's chosen people, they thought of themselves as elite. And you think about that because we're a Jew. We're, you know, we're established. We're going to go to heaven. Everything's right. But you look at scripture over and over, and I was going to talk, find that one scripture I wanted to read to you because I'm about to run out of time. Okay, um, it's Romans verse uh, 9, chapter, uh, verse 25 through 29. Verse 27, it says, um, Israel cries out, uh, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. Now, they all, think about it. He said, though the number of them will be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Why? Because not everyone who was an Israelite or who was a Jew back in that time believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Still don't. Still don't. Again, they wanted to focus still back on the law. And this was prophesied all the way back in Isaiah that he talked about this. He said that they, only a remnant would be saved. Um, and, then, and like I said, and then, and then he says in verse uh, 29, it says, it is just as Isaiah said previously, and unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been like Gomorrah. 
Why? Because of God's mercy, God's grace. He saved the remnant on there. And again, in the course of all of that, those who turn to Christ, those who accepted him as the Messiah, are part of the reason the Gentiles become Christians. Those people who actually knew him as the Messiah, well, let's face it, it would be like in the city of Manchester. If we have certain ones who accept the Messiah, what would we do? We talk to the other people in Manchester about accepting the Messiah. And this is kind of what we forget sometimes. This is like a community on here. Because I'm born again, I want other people to be born again. So whether they are Gentiles or whether they're uh, uh, Jews or whatever, I need to be telling my neighbors, whoever they are, if they heathens, Muslims, whatever they are, it doesn't matter. I need to be telling my neighbors because I am born again. And that's what some of the Jews experienced. They experienced salvation. They accepted the Messiah, and they wanted others to know. That's why there was a remnant left, because they accepted the Messiah on that. Um, again, it says, um, again, a lot of the, in, in verse 30 through 33, it talks about the Gentiles did not pursue righteousness, but have obtained a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Now, let's think about this, because here we start talking about this. Had we gone through the things, seen the things that Pharaoh did, went through those things, don't you think it would be much easier for us to accept the Messiah? Now, there's a lot of these people may not have seen it, but those stories and things were passed down from family to family to family for those who saw it on there. But it's still the same today. We have family members, we have neighbors. They don't understand about us being Christians. They don't understand that you can have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and what it entails. They just decide on their own that they don't want to be that way or they don't want to have anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not sure that everybody says they don't want to have anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. I think they just don't think about it at all. They just don't believe that that's the way to salvation. They just... Well, if I'm a good person or if I do this or do that, again, it's the same thing as the Israelites did. If I, I want to do it my way, I want to do this law. Now, if, I, if I'm a good person and I have helped my neighbor and I do this and do that, I'm, I, I'll make it to heaven. No, again, it's accepting the Messiah. And it's still the same thing goes on today. So how many people do you all, we all know that are very good-natured people, good morally people, but are not born again? And can I say, when I say this, this might shock you. Just because you come to church don't mean you're born again. Because I'm a member of a religious organization does not make me born again. And again, I think some people have, if I do good or be good, then I'll get to heaven. No, again, it's by faith. And again, that is what it, the Israelites and the Jews had the hardest time getting because they felt like it was based on law. And we look back, and maybe it's just a, it's a different people, but it's still the same thing going on today. Very same thing. There are people, if I work good enough, or how many religions do we know that if you do this, so much of this, if you do that, then you'll get to heaven? No, again, it's the same thing. Again, the main subject of these chapters is the Israel's rejection of accepting Christ by faith. Still thinking the law saved them. God is still faithful, even, even when his people reject him, and we can, he can, we can depend on him to accomplish his purposes and keep his promises. Again, he's still working. He's still offering salvation to anyone who wants to accept it. And we as Christians have been born again, and we need to let the world know that we need to be born again. Any thoughts on that before we close? <laughs> That's right, he didn't even like the people. <laughs> he wanted them to go to hell. Anybody that wasn't Israelites, exactly. Exactly, on that. And our, you know, our goal as Christians, we should be trying to win as many people to the Lord as we can. That's what God has us here for. That's our purpose. Any thoughts on this chapter? Now, was it as hard as we thought it was going to be? It's just when you get in there, you get to think about what is he saying? Because sometimes, it's like that, he's a little wordy on there. We have <laughs> exactly, exactly. We have down days just like he did. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some problems. Mm -hmm. Go the other way. 
that, and that grieves our heart. It's hard for us. But again, some people think they have made it on their own themselves on that. All right, well, let's just close. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. And we thank you that you love us with an everlasting love and you draw us to you. And Lord, that you are a graceful and merciful God. And we just thank you for that. And go with us through this night. In thy name we pray, amen.